We're in that one lawsuit. One's enough. But one reason why our guests today come close to the front of the, of the list of the heroes is that they have turned that battle into their life's work. I could uh, recite their biographies to you. Uh, it's been written on history with a better pen than I'll ever have. Uh, you've all seen it before. So instead, I will simply present to you Madeline Murray O'Hare and John Miller. I thought to do something a little bit different today, and that is to talk about myself rather than about the issue of First Amendment or the issue of atheism, for which I am mostly known. And I'm supposed to have about a 20-minute presentation, and John Murray, who is now the president of American Atheist is going to tell you about our legal uh, issues of state church separation as they are posited in atheism. So I wrote a little speech for myself, and I hope you don't mind if I refer to it as I go here, uh, because it's hard sometimes to remember all of the events of one's life. I'm not certain when I first came up here that I was in the right place. Uh, it hardly looks like the basement of the YMCA. <laughs> and I asked myself, is this a place and why am I here? And then I thought, well, I had better tell them why, why they are here. It was back in the very early 1950s, in 1950 itself, that I came to Houston. And I had one year of law school under my belt. And I was hankering to finish my LLB. My first year had been spent at the Warren G. Harding School of Law at Ohio Northern University in Ada, Ohio. One woman and myself gained entry to the law school, and the first day we were there, we were called into the dean's office, and he sat us down and very quickly and abruptly delivered a couple of announcements. We may have got into the school, but we were not going to get out. He was not going to permit any woman to graduate from a law school because law uh, was a man's concern, not a woman's concern. And we were intruding where we were not needed, were not wanted, and could not make ourselves apply. We were wasting our time trying to get into what was the men's domain, and he would use any effort he could to force us out. And that was my introduction to law in the United States. I didn't see the other woman after that day. I don't know whether she finished or not. But I finished one year. And at the end of that year, my family moved to Houston, Texas. And dutifully, because I admire families, particularly my own, I came along uh, with my family to Houston. And I gained employment with the probation department of Harris County. And the uh, head of the Harris County de probation department wanted to be a lawyer, so he was following the news of the day. And he would come and talk to me now and then because he knew uh, that I wanted to finish my law degree. And he came one day and he said, do you know that there is a small law school that is going to open up this September? And he said, I think that you and I should go down and try to see if we could get in. Uh, we had both looked at the University of Houston which had the lousiest law school in the Southwest. <laughs> and we decided then that we would go ahead and try with this law school. And uh, what it was is that some very upstart, and I do mean upstart, smart-ass attorneys, uh, who were practicing law had decided that they wanted to start a school where they would actually teach the law that was practiced. Not theory, not anything else, but what happened in their law offices and what happened in the courts of Harris County. They wanted to teach hands-on law. And they had very, uh, a great deal of ambition, but they had very little money. So they rented, rented the basement of the YMCA and set up classes there. And my boss and I immediately applied for admission, and we were accepted, and we traipsed off to class. And in one of my classes, I had a tremendous number of student peers, 12. The first semester, I took one class in legal ethics, and that's what I remember most about Southwest Texas of College of Law. I was horrified to find that the, the attorney who was teaching it was fighting 
for the child's, for his own child's custody in a very bitter divorce uh, battle. And I had been assigned by the probation department to evaluate the situation. I dared not let him know that I was the person who was doing the basic evaluation while somebody else was presenting it to him. But he was from Louisiana, and I, he had the thickest southern drawl I have ever heard. And the first day in class, he stood up in front of us and looked rather hopelessly at the few who were there. And then he made his entire life commitment known to us. He drawled. The only difference between a man and a hog is dignity. And for the rest of that semester, he taught us all of the things that an attorney should be. The foremost was dignified. Dignified in his life. Dignified in his ethics. Dignified in his profession. Dignified in his community. I loved that man. The impact he made on me was extraordinary. And I have never talked, I never talked to him about anything in the class much. I never talked to him outside of class. I was afraid to because of that custody fight. And I never talked to him in any way other than to find that he personified dignity in everything that he did. Now, I spent a total of 11 years in universities, colleges, and graduate schools. And in all of that time, I have never met a professor who was so profoundly full of dignity, learning, warmth, and outreach, as was he. You know, I don't even remember his name. I think it might have been Reuben, but I've been racking my brains for the last couple of days to see if that was right. I completed law school here, and I had to wait on my diploma, which was sent to me many months later because the school never got it together enough to get the diplomas printed. <laughs> they sent it to me by mail, and since that time, I have read all of the news items about the school and have an interest in it. And once my son drove me past the old building, and that's about all that I knew of, uh, about South Texas College of Law. But all of my memories here are inextricably uh, bound up with a man who taught me uh, legal ethics. And as the professors came and said hello to me today, I asked each one, what do you teach? I was hoping one of them was going to say legal ethics. As I look around me now in our culture, I remember his drawl and his assertion that the only difference between a man and a hog was dignity. And today, I think that dignity is on the side of the hog. <laughs> I received my LLB on August the 30th, 1952. That was 43 years ago. And I think I was the first woman to get a degree in this college. At that time, there were only several thousand female attorneys in the entire United States. And now I want to digress a little bit because this is why I studied law. I have very, very, very deep roots in a union family. And during the time that I was studying law here, there were no textbooks, no courses, no anything on what had happened with the unions in the United States. And I used to weep over my law books. I wept over them regularly as I ran into a case here or there which explicated what, those, what was done to those poor bastards. Union organizers, union strikers, union educators, even just advocates of unionism. The courts, the courts of this nation have dirty, dirty, dirty records in their handling of those issues. The judges, the court systems, 99% of the attorneys the law enforcement agents and agencies, the politicians, the elected officials were totally and completely corrupt and totally subservient to the minions of capitalism and almost universally anti-union, anti-labor. But toward those union organizers themselves, all of these people were harsh, brutal, vindictive, callous, and inhuman. The union organizers were routinely framed, imprisoned, and in several instances executed, while nothing was done in respect to the strike breakers, the so-called scabs who needing work, replaced the workers where they could. And nothing was done about the brutal Pinkertons, whose name is still infamous in our land, and about other subversive agents, not the least of which was the American government. Nothing was done about profit-hungry management. Nothing was done about paid-off judges. Nothing was done about politicians. And actually, underneath it all, I simply wanted to champion the legal issues of the American unions. I wanted so much 
to help the laboring man. Well, I finished law school here. And then I attempted to take the Texas bar examination. And I was discovered then that it was necessary for me to have a belief in God to be accepted by the Texas bar or to practice law in Texas, and that is still there. All of you to practice law in Texas must believe in God. And all of you, in order to get into the bar, must believe in God. I was then a thoroughly convinced atheist, just as I am now, and knowing union history in depth for as many years of my life as I had been, and confronted with the McCarthy hysteria of the 1950s, I knew that it was hopeless. And I had the proverbial snowball's chance in hell to try to get into the Texas bar. But all I've ever done in my life was to take a test, and usually tests got me something. And I could beat anyone at anything on any test at any time. You all know that song. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. That got me through life. It got me my scholarships to go to college. Uh, when I went into the Army, and the Army gave me an AGCT test, that's an Army General Classification Test, it immediately drew me apart and put me in officer's training school. Any place I ever went, if I took a test, all right, I was the top. And, of course, when this attitude that anything you can do, I can do better, has endeared me to people throughout my life. <laughs> But I couldn't pass the Texas bar exam. They wouldn't let me even file an application. I couldn't do anything. And no practicing attorney in Texas that I knew of at that time would touch the matter, because each and every one of them had taken that god oath. So what do I do? Now I would know, but then I didn't know. So I did take a test. I took the necessary civil service examination for a foreign service appointment. And naturally, I scored the highest grade in the country, and I knew that of the top three finalists, we would get the top three jobs. So I just said, all right, I'll wait. In addition to that, I had a veteran's preference because I had spent three years in foreign service. I spent three years in Africa, Italy, and France, and I've got battle stars to prove it on my medals. In the Second World War, I was a commissioned officer in the Women's Army Corps and I principally served with the United States Army Signal Corps in which I was a cryptographic security analyst officer. So I waited for my appointment then and that was what, 40 years ago? I'm still waiting. So the only thing I could do was take another test. So I took another test and I went to the Health, Education and Welfare Department uh, adjudicating claims under the Social Security Administration as an attorney for that administration. But fear was the smell of the land and McCarthyism was rife. The only government union, and naturally I was interested in that, in the land was that of the United States Post Office. Three different attempts had been made to unionize the Social Security Administration and all three had failed. The last one tried had ended with the union organizer in front of the House on American Activities Committee and finally going to jail. Well, I analyzed what had gone on before and thought that I saw what was wrong with the effort. The previous attempts had all been to unionize from the bottom up the clerical staff of health, education, and welfare, grades one through three. So I decided to organize the lawyers who were doing, doing the disability adjudications, grades 7 through 11. And I did it. I contacted the American Federation of Government and Employees, and within a month, I had a union. And in doing that, I bumped into a man who also became very dear to me. His name was James Anderson. I think he might be in Houston still, but he was in Baltimore then. He was a black man, an attorney also, and he had to work for the government for the same reason that I did, that I couldn't get a job anywhere else then, because of what I thought and because of what I believed in. He filed a suit demanding that the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, then located in Baltimore, Maryland, hire a proportion of blacks equal to the center percentage of blacks in the population of the city. 
Can you imagine this in 1952? Ultimately, he won the case. Affirmative action, eat your heart out. He got his victory, and he got it over 40 years ago. You never hear of him, because they hate him pretty badly. <laughs> it was at that time also that they came to hate me, because I got the union in. We got onto the shit list of the United States government, James Anderson and I at that time, and I stayed there for the rest of my life, and even now, the United States government is still on me. Uh, one of the things that I pride myself with is a letter that I have that I got from Freedom of Information uh, when I demanded from the FBI the letter which Herbert Hoover circulated to put me on the COINTEL list. If you know COINTEL, that was the, for the organization of the FBI that uh, put together false stories about, quote, radicals in the United States and floated them throughout the United States. So the thing is, my union is still there. That's the union that belongs to me. And the Social Security Administration still hires the correct percentage of blacks, and that belongs to James Anderson. Now, before I go on, I think that I should say something about sexual activities, drugs, and alcohol debauchery, because everybody does. <laughs> Give me some water. No one, of, and think about this, no one of any stature in the United States no folk hero, and after all, I'm supposed to be a folk hero, can be accepted or appreciated by the public if they do not have a sordid background <laughs> and come from generations of dysfunctional families. <laughs> so I'm going to feel funny about this, but I may as well tell you it's kind of difficult to make confessions in public. But my mother was not a slut. <laughs> She did not use cane, she wasn't a drunkard, she was not a lesbian. And my father neither beat nor abused me, and I was not raped when I was three months old. He did not, my father did not desert his family, and he was totally drug and alcohol free. The values I have came from my family, and my family were very decent people. Should I leave the stage? <laughs> From that came this feeling that I have, that my body belongs to me now. And it belonged to me way back then. I was not porking my boss at the probation department in Houston. And I was not porking Mr. Anderson because he was black and magnificent. And I was not porking any radicals of any age, size, shape, color, description, or title. I have never used drugs of any nature. I am not an alcoholic and I've never been one. I have never been kinky enough to be into sadomasochistic relationships, dominance, slavery, or bondage, oral or anal sex, dual masturbation encounters, and I have never swapped tongues with man, woman, or beast. <laughs> I've never been the victim of incest, date rape, rape spousal abuse, I'm just about as goddamn square as anyone you ever ran into. <laughs> Except, of course, I'm an atheist. P put a pin in that. I loved both my father and my mother. I had a very pleasant childhood, and I have enjoyed life at every stage. But anyway, both Mr. Anderson and I went through psychological brutalization that none of the wimps of today could withstand, and we did it without counseling. Suffice it to say that we both lost our employment. So then I decided, all right, you didn't like that. I'll try to organize the agents of the FBI in Washington, D.C., <laughs> as well as in the famous CIA uh, fort near Hollabird. Well, I got into real trouble doing that, so much trouble that the American Federation of Government Employees wouldn't even look at me anymore. So then I went to the National Institute of Mental Health, and I took another test, and that gave me a scholarship. So I went in for a master's degree in psychiatric so social work at Howard University. I was one of two women, both white, 
the only white women up until that time who had ever d uh, dared to try to enter a completely black university. And once I was in there, I was assigned as the first Gentile to work in a Jewish family and children's agency in Baltimore. And out of Howard, I obtained a job when I was finished as a supervisor in the juvenile department of the Baltimore Depart Department of Public Welfare. And the first day that I was on that job, we had a conference in the biggest, most prestigious hotel in Baltimore City. I'll never forget it. My, that was a beautiful hotel. And we all walked across the street to go into that hotel when what do you know that I ran into a picket line. The service employees of the hotel were on strike and on my first day of work I refused to cross a picket line and every other person did. All those caring social workers crossed those lines and I lost my respect for them forever. That ended that, that day. Even back in the 1950s, there were few persons of principle in the United States. And that left an open field for me because I'm a principled person. So I organized the Baltimore protest against Strontium 90. And you're thinking, what the hell is she talking about? Well, there was atmospheric testing of atomic devices in the 1950s. And Strontium 90, which is um, fatal, I, I think I would prefer to say, was released into the atmosphere, and later Strontium 90 was found in milk all over the United States. I also helped to forge an alliance against the Cold War, and I was one of eight persons who went to the Capitol in Washington, D.C., and staged a sit-down strike in the Department of Defense, saying that we would sit in their office until they ended it. We stayed there for three days before we were carried out bodily. I was one, if not the main organizer, of the picketing of the White House against the Bay of Pigs invasion. And for those of you who do not know history, that was when the United States planned an invasion of Cuba. And I was the principal planner for the peace marches in ba Baltimore when we circled Baltimore with an imaginary ring to show how much of it would blow be blown up if a nuclear device was exploded. And then we marched across the diameter of that circle every Easter until we had effectively ruined the Easter parades in front of the churches. <laughs> by badgering, by badgering it, I forced the American Association of University Women to permit me to hold weekly meetings at its beautiful, beautiful building in Baltimore, rent-free, to bring in speakers who opposed the war in Vietnam. And this was before the fall of Dien Bien Phu, when France was still the aggressors in that nation and the United States had not yet entered into the war in Vietnam. I put together the first experiment in the United States with family counseling involving the mothers of dependent, neglected, or delinquent children. And I worked for some time with a judge from Cleveland, Ohio, who wanted to have court personnel and attorneys acquainted through an educational process with social workers and social organizations to better understand the objectives of the social organizations. And conversely, to educate the social workers and the social agency personnel with the courts and the legal systems. It's not even being done now. Boy, did we get nowhere. And I tried to do something with migrant workers or with living conditions in migrant working camps. If you want to run up against tyrannical landowners, try that. You can get murdered almost any time at all, interfering with such bona fide activities of American capitalists. I was the one who convinced Harry Truman to send a personal letter to the White House expressing his continuing opposition to and condemnation of the McCarran Act, which he had vetoed while he was president. That's the McCarran Act was to force injunctions against strikes, strikes being reinstated so that strikes could continue and the unions could be busted and it was also painted with a communist brush. 
And when I received his statement, everyone with whom I was working prevailed upon me to permit a black minister to deliver it to the White House. And I was damn fool enough to let them do it. Incidentally, to answer your first question, I am not a communist. They are so right-wing that I can't stand them. <laughs> I picketed White House towers in Baltimore, which refused to serve blacks. And I was there organizing and picketing during the famous riots in Cambridge, Maryland, when the United States brought out army tanks. And I picketed the movie houses, which refused entries to blacks in Baltimore. And Bill Moore, I'm sure you don't know him either, leaving my home with a sign he and I had made together on my kitchen floor. He took his famous walk to Mississippi, and his sign said, black or white, eat at Joe's. He had his brains blown out at 6 p.m. on April the 27th, 1963, on U.S. Highway 11 near Colburn, Alabama. No one was ever charged with that murder, no media would ever hint at the fact that he was an atheist carrying and distributing atheist literature on the walk. So I wound up with a very deep and abiding intellectual hatred for the injustices, oppressions, cruelties, discriminations, and coercions in our culture, for the lies and deceits and the duplicities. Please notice that I said intellectual hatred and that's a concept I'm not sure that you understand. But beneath all of my activity, despite the good jobs I did, was a non-acceptance of me, because first, I was an atheist. And the people with whom I was working quite frequently would say, you as an atheist can't be the one that takes the letter to the White House. Second, because I was a woman, you have no idea how women are hated in America by the left until you try a couple of years in action with them. And third, because I was not into sex, booze, or drugs, I wasn't kinky enough. I would not stand, I absolutely refused to stand beside a minister, a rabbi, or a priest. I refused to attend rallies at any churches. I would not join in prayer as a solution to any problem because prayer does nothing. And I would not be a sinner seeking redemption, and there was no way that I was going to kiss male ass. <laughs> you have no idea how saturated in the religion the so-called liberals are. Right now, when you see abortion, the abortion issue is religious. There isn't a liberal in the United States who will say so. Well, then finally, accidentally, I bumped into the issue of Bible reading and prayer saying in the public schools of the nation. It made my day. In fact, it made my life because it was nice, clean, intellectual, and I was alone with it. I was alone with it absolutely because I based my arguments not under the First Amendment to the Constitution, but because prayer is insane and children should not be taught to pray. It doesn't help them with anything. However, I had no recourse but to go in under an establishment clause uh, suit, and I did. But had there been no constitution, I would have gone after the prayer anyway. No one else wanted to be involved. And I don't think anybody had either the brains, the guts, or the heart. So I went after it. And for the past 32 years, I have been introducing atheism to America and America to atheism. I'm 76 years old now, and I'm not about to stop. I'm a little unsteady on my feet. And uh, the fact is, though, that I am no longer alone. My son, John Garth Murray, is taking over. He's the president of American Atheist, and I am going to deliver him in, you into his capable hands. And after he is all done with everything, I have a daughter, Robin Murray O'Hare, who is 10 years younger than John, who is going to be perfectly willing to take on everyone after him. Thank you very much.
Well, I'm John Murray, as you've been told, and I have been the acting president of American Atheists, an organization founded by my mother, Madeline O'Hare, uh, in 1963, since about April of 1986. I was reared as a second-generation atheist, which makes me an anomaly even among atheists. There aren't very many of us. I grew up in a predominantly Roman Catholic Baltimore, Maryland, and organizing atheism began for me back in about 1959 at age five, so I've been at it a long time. When my older brother at the time, William, then age 14, decided that it was hypocritical for him uh, as also a person raised uh, in an atheist home to be forced to participate in mandatory Bible reading and prayer recitation, that is, of the Lord's Prayer specifically, in the Baltimore public schools. My mother set out on a course uh, of what, and she didn't know it was called this at the time, I don't think, of exhausting administrative remedies, which meant running the gauntlet of all of the um, school boards. Finally, uh, that didn't work, and obtaining counsel, and rather poor counsel it was, too, uh, a suit was filed against the Baltimore School Board over uh, their mandatory requirement for saying of that prayer. That cause wound its way through the court system, and a decision was handed down by the Supreme Court of the United States on June the 17th, 1963, when I was eight years old. That decision and the four years of living hell, and that's the only way I can describe it, that my family had been subjected to by the kind Christian and chiefly Catholic population of Baltimore, Maryland, changed my life forever. At the end of 1963, I turned nine years old, just about a week before President Kennedy was shot in Dallas, Texas. I recall standing in line with my mother and my brother at that time all night long for 12, maybe 14 hours, up in a kind of a, a rainy, as I recall, and cold Washington, D.C., to file past President Kennedy's coffin lying there in state in the rotunda of the capital of the United States. That was an end for me, too, that night, even as my life was just beginning, because it was an end to a life of normalcy. From that, a very eventful year of 1963, which saw Martin Luther King proclaim his dream at the Lincoln Memorial. It saw the end to religious ceremonies in public schools across the United States, at least an official end to them, and the slaying of a president I was cast uh, in the mold of an atheist organizer, even at that, that uh, young stage of life, and an activist atheist for the rest of my life. I was to be no leave it to beaver type kid at all. I was going to be different. Following that landmark decision, which was Murray versus Curlett, C-U-R-L-E-T-T, -T, the site is 374 U.S. 203 for all of you law students, and I urge you to go and look it up and read it. Uh, at the year that it was handed down in terms of word count, it was the longest decision ever rendered by the United States Supreme Court. There have been longer ones since, but it was the longest ones in terms of uh, the total number of words. My mother, after that decision, was immediately unemployable in the United States uh, as uh, not just an atheist anymore, but the atheist. As a matter of fact, something called Fact Magazine, which is no longer published at that time, headlined her in a very famous article that it entitled, The Most Hated Woman in America. Well, to my very great pleasure, she's retained that title to this day, and I'm damn proud of it, and I hope she continues uh, with that title. So she became what we refer to ourselves as essentially as a professional atheist and set out to try to affect change in our culture based on the perspective of a lifestyle without religion or a lifestyle without superstition as we put it. The first organization she founded starting out in 1963 was something called Other Americans Inc. And you say, well, how'd she get that name? Well, at the time in the 50s, there was an organization called Protestants and other Americans for the separation of uh, ch uh, church and state. Uh, and she knew that she wasn't Protestant, 
So she figured that she must be one of those other Americans they were talking about. <laughs> so she borrowed the name Other Americans for the first organization and uh, incorporated it in Baltimore, Maryland. Later, that organization changed its name some years down the road to Society of Separationists, Inc., meaning those persons who want separation of state and church. And notice the juxtaposition of words. What everything we do and everything we write, we always refer to it as separation of state and church, not church and state, because we feel the state is the more important partner uh, of the two. Of course, we're often asked whether or not we're a divorce counseling organization with that separationist name, but that's not it. It's separation of state and church. And finally, in the, about the mid-1970s, Society of Separationists, Inc. started doing business as DBA, American Atheists, and then finally, American an entity called American Atheists, Inc., later on, uh, was incorporated to take the place of Society of Separationists. Later, she also founded an American Atheist Library and Archives, which now houses, in Austin, Texas, the world's largest collection of books and other materials in descent, in descent to religion. There used to be two others. One of those it was in Leningrad in the heretofore Soviet Union, and the other one was the Theosophical Society Library, uh, founded by an atheist gone mad, Annie Bassant, in Madras, India. Uh, and uh, I don't know what happened to that Madras library. I was there about, what, 10 or 15 years ago, and I don't know if it's still there, but I'm quite sure probably that the religionists now <laughs> occupying the Soviet Union in droves have lo looted that Lenin library by now. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I haven't been to the Soviet Union in about four or five uh, uh, or six years, something like that. Uh, also, uh, there was founded an American Atheist Press dedicated to providing a form for those in dissent to religion to be able to speak uh, about that dissent in an uncensored way. American Atheists uh, published a monthly journal of atheist news and thought, a magazine for about 27 years. Established, we established a network of about 45 some odd local chapters of our organization in as many states. That chapter program lasted for a little bit over 20 years. We sponsored a national American atheist radio series uh, that was on in about 100 and some radio stations around the country. And that lasted for about eight years until uh, most of those stations turned to music and chiefly rock format and dropped uh, a lot of their uh, talk, which is just now staging a comeback. We've held 27 national annual conventions uh, in the ballpark of about 500 people or so at each one in various cities around the country. And we are now in our 15th year of production of a weekly American Atheist Forum series of programs for cable television, which can be seen right now in 130 major cities and serves 9.3 million homes here in the United States. We publish a monthly newsletter. We sponsor a computer bulletin board out of Austin, Texas, for any of you who are into that. Uh, I can give you the number in the question and answer period. We publish a catalog of over 150 paperback titles, and we provide information on atheist positions to the media and to institutions such as the one we're speaking in front of here today. American Atheists was founded basically to fight for two things in the United States. And one is the complete and absolute separation of state and church. And again, if you'll note the order of the words, uh, we uh, have been laboring for a Jeffersonian concept of state church separation. That is not just to give lip service to it in documents, but to actually have a separation. And number two, we established American Atheists to fight for the civil rights of persons who call themselves atheists, or the civil right to allow people to call themselves atheists openly uh, in the public. These two causes, were to be taken on in the founding of the organization and have been taken on from a perspective that is unique to atheists. And that is that religion is essentially what we call myth information. That is, that there is no God, there is, there is no hell, there is no heaven, 
There are no he, she, it, or them, whatever you want to call the deity, to answer prayers. We do not oppose and did not oppose prayers in the public school because of any kind of denominational or establishment clause type concerns actually, but because prayer as a human act is irrational. Children should be taught the value rather in school of self-determination, what we call inner direction, logic and the scientific method, and not to whine before an imaginary deity to get what they want. That's not good education. Prayer basically is talking to yourself, only that and nothing more. And that act we feel is so singularly stupid that those who do it find comfort in carrying it out in groups, or should I say perhaps congregations is a better word. There has always been an effort by those religious to command the silence and acquiescence of others whenever and wherever they decide it is appropriate to engage in the act of prayer. And that's where they run up against us. It is what we objected to in 1963, along with the mindlessness of the act itself. We demanded at that time a freedom from religion to stand equal side by side to the right of a relig religionist to have freedom of his or her religion. And that has been the basis of our fight for more than 30 years. We have yet to win as atheists that right to this day. You do not have the right to freedom from religion in America at all. Every case that American atheists has litigated in the separation of state and church arena since 1963 has been approached on the premise that atheists ought to have the right to be free from religion. Unfortunately, the only way we have to bring this issue before any court is through the First Amendment, which only protects freedom of religion. Think about that for a minute. It says, and you should all know it by heart by now, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The amendment takes for granted that all Americans have a religion and that the government of the United States should not play favorites or take sides as to one religion being better than the other i.e. establishing that religion through government action as a favored one. At the same time, government shall not inhibit the free exercise of religion, again still operating on the premise that all Americans have a religion to exercise. Then comes the atheist. So what do you do with us in that kind of constitutional scenario? What is to be done with a citizen who has no religion and whose lifestyle cannot be defined as religious? We've learned the bitter answer to that question over 30 years as we've watched atheists be systematically disenfranchised by the legislative branch with the full support of the judicial. Fundamentally, the answer is that atheists have been ignored treated as though they did not exist, and told that they must simply hush up while the powers that be exercise what is called benevolent neutrality toward religion. Ours is the most religious nation in the world. Not overtly, we're not like an Iran, for example, but covertly, insidiously, and what we call systemically. On the surface, no elected or appointed official, high or petty, would come right out and say that an atheist has no rights as a citizen of this country, <laughs> except, of course, George Bush. And I'm talking about George Bush Sr., who did just that when he was the vice president and running for the presidency at a Chicago O'Hare Airport press conference when a reporter asked him about the prayer in school issue and he said that he favored prayer, and then the reporter said, well, what about atheists? And he says, well, I'm not very high on atheists. And then the reporter said, well, surely you grant them their rights. And he said, no, I don't think that I do. Nobody has a right to be an atheist in the United States. We're one nation under God. And that man was elected president. Every camera was there, ABC, CBS, CNN, 
uh, Fox, everybody. They got it down on camera, and we were never able to get that footage from one of them. We weren't able to get a single media organization in the world to back us up that he actually said that, except the one person who asked the question of him. And he was there with a room full of reporters. And they took that footage and probably destroyed it so that that man could get into the White House. Now we have son of Bush as our governor here in Texas, so we can watch what he's going to do with atheists. On the other hand, each of those very same officials, who generally wouldn't say it out loud except for Bush, use the power of their office, office to implement laws and regulations which force the atheist into a life of hypocrisy or silence or isolationism and rejection. Let me just give you an example of some very few of those laws. The Pledge of Allegiance recognizes the existence of a supreme being since June the 14th, 1954. The House report on that legislation at the time stated that the purpose of the amendment to amend the Pledge of Allegiance was to affirm the principle that, quote, our people and our government are dependent upon the moral directions of the Creator, quote, end quote. This is, was a simple acknowledgment of religion uh, being placed into the pledge, which then said, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That under God portion was not contained in there prior to June 1954. On the currency and coins, an act of March the 3rd, 1865, uh, made uh, the term, uh, in God we trust, allowable only, where it fit the design, but not mandatory, on coins, on just coins, not paper money. It wasn't until um, uh, <coughs> the uh, 19, was uh, May of 1908, uh, during Teddy Roosevelt's administration, I believe, that the first mandatory requirement came for coins. And God We Trust didn't go on paper money until July the 11th of 1955. Uh, and I have all the public law citations for all of these for anybody who's interested. A national day of prayer was brought about as a joint resolution of Congress approved April the 17th, 1952. Uh, and a later law enacted on May the 5th, 1988, set aside a specific day for that National Day of Prayer, the first th Thursday of the each month of May. The national motto in uh, July 30th, 1956, our national motto was declared to be, in God we trust, replacing the prior national motto that had lasted us for uh, 100 and, uh, uh, more than 100 years, which was e pluribus unum, of many people, out of many come one, signifying the melting pot nature uh, of our country. The national anthem adopted as our national uh, anthem in 1931, many of you probably don't know, in its latter stanzas that hardly anybody ever sings and doesn't know exist, uh, touts religion with the words, in God is our trust. <coughs> On September the 6th, 1966, Public Law 89-554 was passed requiring that any individual elected or appointed to an office of honor or profit in the civil service of the uniformed services, with the exception of the President of the United States, must take an oath or affirmation of allegiance concluding with the phrase, so help me God. The President was excluded because of Article 11, Section 1 of the Constitution, which does not require him to uh, say, so help me God, uh, at the end uh, of his oath uh, as it is prescribed. And of course, this is despite the fact that Article 6 of the Constitution of the United States says directly that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. And in addition to that, more of the same, the states got into it. In the state of North Carolina, the Constitution of the state of North Carolina, Article 6, under suffrage and eligibility to office, Section 8, disqualification of office, holds the following person shall be disqualified for office. First, any person... Qualification, Section 2, 
No person who denies the being of God or a future state of rewards and punishments shall hold any office in the civil departments of this state. Texas, hold on to your hats. The Constitution of the State of Texas, Article 1, Section 4 in its Bill of Rights holds. Religious rights. No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust in this state, nor shall anyone be excluded from holding office on account of his religious sentiments, comma, provided he acknowledges the existence of a supreme being, period. In Arkansas, the alma mater state of our current president, the Constitution of the State of Arkansas, Article 19, Miscellaneous Provisions, Section 1. No person who denies the being of God shall hold any office in the civil departments of this state, nor be competent to testify as a witness in any court. South Carolina. The Constitution of the State of South Carolina, Section 12, Qualification for the Office of Governor. No person shall be eligible to the office of governor who denies the existence of a supreme being, period. And Pennsylvania, last but not least. The Constitution of the State of Pennsylvania, Declaration of Rights, Article 1, Section 4. No person who acknowledges the being of God and a future state of rewards and punishment shall, comma, on account of his religious statements, be disqualified to hold any office of public uh, or place of trust or profit under this commonwealth. Same thing essentially as Texas, only they start out at the beginning of the clause instead of at the end of it. The object of all these laws, both federal and state, is essentially to establish religion as a preferred component of citizenship. What we are being told every day is that we may have religious freedom in this country as long as one has a religion. If you choose not to participate in religion, you can exist. Sure, there's no doubt about that. We're living proof of it but you can only exist in a position of disadvantage to citizens who do believe in a God. That's what the bottom line is here. Why is religion preferred by government? It's very simple to any student of history. Because it delivers to those who govern a docile and malleable populace who are conditioned to obedience to authority, because that's the name of the game with religion. Religion performed that duty very well in the monarchies of Europe, and there was no need for democracy to divorce itself of those services. It merely had to disguise them under the guise of freedom of religion. So American atheists set out in 1963 to try to challenge one by one the laws, and regulations, and practices which collectively combined to instill into the hearts and minds of Americans that religion was good for them. <laughs> kind of like Wonder Bread. It might taste like shit, but it's good for you. In all of those cases, we sought to fought, fight for a list of principles that, although not complete, were best enunciated actually about 119 years ago. You didn't know there were atheists that long ago, did you? Yes, and they were organized too. By a free thought group convened in Philadelphia at that time. And they announced what they called at that time the nine demands of liberalism, and here they are. And these will sound familiar to you uh, for cases that have been fought over these issues through the years. One, we demand that churches and other ecclesiastical properties shall be no longer exempt from taxation. Two, we demand that the employment of chaplains in Congress, in the legislatures, in the Navy, and militia, and in prisons, asylums, and all other institutions supported by public money shall be discontinued. Three, we demand that all public appropriations for education and charitable institutions of a sectarian character shall cease. Four, we demand that all religious services now sustained by the government shall be abolished and especially that the use of the Bible in the public schools, whether ostensibly as a textbook or avowedly as a book of religious worship, shall be prohibited. Five, we demand that the appointment by the President of the United States or by the governors of various states 
of all religious festivals and fasts shall wholly cease. Six, we demand that the, the judicial oath in the courts and in all other departments of government shall be abolished and that simple affirmation under the pains and penalties of perjury shall be established in its stead. Seven, we demand that all laws directly or indirectly enforcing the observance of Sunday as the Sabbath shall be repealed. Eight, we demand that all laws looking to the enforcement of Christian morality shall be abrogated and that all laws shall be conformed to the requirement of natural morality, equal rights, and impartial liberty. Nine, we demand that not only the Constitution of the United States and of the several states, but also in the practical administration of the same, no privileges or advantages shall be conceded to Christianity or any other special religion that our entire political system shall be founded and administered on a purely secular basis and that whatever changes shall prove necessary to this end shall be consistently, unflinchingly, and promptly made. And that's from 119 uh, uh, years ago. Well, now what I'd like to try to do is to run through in a, just an abbreviated list of some of the specific litigation in which American Atheist was involved over more than 30 years to attempt to achieve some of those goals uh, that were articulated in those nine demands over a century ago. Huh, and I'll try to do this as quickly as I can without, uh, without the names. And I will have who versus who for anybody who wants to ask, but that's kind of uh, immaterial to the discussion. First, we f in 1970, American Atheists filed an amicus curiae case, which sought, uh, filed an amicus curiae brief in a case before the United States Supreme Court over the tax exemption of real property of churches. In uh, 1978, we attempted to remove the in phrase and God we trust from U.S. coins and currency in the federal court. Uh, the court um, uh, denied us, saying that that is simply a ceremonial act and has nothing to do with religion. In 1981, a member of American Atheist challenged prayer at high school commencements in, Ch uh, commencements in Chandler, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix, and won. Uh, in 1980, uh, a group of American Atheists in Utah uh, opposing the broadening of property a tax exemption for uh, the Mormon church properties there, sued and won of all places. Um, in 1980, American atheists challenged legislation requiring prayer in the Massachusetts public school system, uh, and the legislature dropped uh, that prayer requirement before the matter could come to trial. In 1979, uh, a member of American Atheists uh, was supported because we challenged his dismissal as an, uh, from his employment as a teacher in the Dallas Public Schools because uh, of the fact that um, uh, he was an atheist. Uh, we lost that one. They blackballed him and they forced him out and he never uh, was able really to teach in Dallas again. Uh, another member of American Atheists challenged opening prayers at the city council uh, meetings in a prominent city in New Jersey, and the court held that the prayers were appropriate. Uh, so much for that. American atheists challenged the opening of pr uh, uh, with prayers the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate. The court held that they were traditional and could continue in that vein, and that prayer had absolutely nothing to do with religion, the court said. It was merely a traditional exercise. In 1980, American atheists challenged a nativity scene displayed in the rotunda of the capital of Texas in 1980, and the court held that that crash, are you ready for this, represented the nuclear family and had absolutely nothing to do with religion in any context, <laughs> so the crash stayed. 1977, American atheists challenged opening prayers at the city council meetings in Austin, Texas. In order to get that challenge done, Madeleine Murray O'Hare had to be arrested at the beginning of a council meeting. The police chief of Austin, Texas was waiting there to arrest her personally with great joy for as she interrupted the invocation. Um, and uh, the court held that that prayer could continue since it was merely a gavel which called the um, meeting to order and had no religious significance whatsoever. 
1976, uh, we challenged the practice of a judge in Detroit, Michigan, permitting a prayer group to use his courtrooms for prayer meetings every day. Uh, the lawyer uh, hired for the, we hired for the case disappeared with our money, and the, and the judge kept doing what he was doing. Uh, American atheists in 1982 challenged the IRS practice of permitting taxpayers to deduct gifts from religion from their 1040, and of the court threw us out of that one for standing to sue. Uh, we, they do a lot of that with uh, minority litigants uh, on the good old uh, standing to sue uh, issue. Uh, American atheists in 79 sued the state of North Carolina over its state constitutional requirement, one of the ones that I read, uh, about God. Uh, the phrase was dropped from the Constitution uh, in North Carolina. In 1979, we sued Mississippi over its Constitution, uh, and uh, the phrase uh, was dropped, uh, we won there also. In 1978, American atheists sued the state of Texas to have its constitutional um, uh, requirement dropped. Uh, that ended in a consent decree uh, signed by the federal district judge in Austin, Texas to drop it. Uh, however, if you pick up any state of Texas constitution right now, go and look at the one that's in your law library or your school library right here, you will find that there's no asterisk, no footnote, no appendix at, any, at anywhere in the current printed copy to show that that provision was voided by consent decree, so essentially it continues to be observed. We're trying to do something about that right now uh, with the new Republican legislature in Austin trying to see if we can at least get a footnote in the next printing of the Constitution. Of course, we think that will be to no avail. In 1978, we sued the state of Tennessee uh, over its Constitution uh, and won there with that uh, um, uh, phrase being dropped. In 1978, a member of American Atheists challenged the county library system in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the court ordered the library system had to accept atheist, an atheist magazine if it accepted religious magazines on its rack for public use. In 1983, we uh, sued on behalf of a member in Virginia uh, who got a vanity or personalized plate that was atheist, spelled A-T-H-E-S-T, -E because there are only six letters or spaces allowed in Virginia. Uh, and um, he was ordered to turn in the plates because one Christian in the state of Virginia objected uh, and felt, uh, saw him driving along and felt that this was ob ob objectable to them. Uh, and the uh, court, uh, clear up through the United States Supreme Court, approved of that recall of his plate, and he lost his atheist license plate uh, in the state of Virginia. In 1979, we sued uh, the National Park Service uh, for providing facilities to the, to the Pope uh, for holding a Roman Catholic Mass on the Washington Mall during his visit to the United States in 1978, using all of that taxpayer's money and federal ground. The court ruled that under the Freedom of Speech Clause of the First Amendment, uh, that the Pope was protected uh, in his freedom of speech to speak where he liked, uh, the, despite the fact that he was using several million dollars of taxpayers' money to do so. In 1964, American atheists challenged the Federal Communication Commission to extend the Fairness Doctrine so as to permit atheists to share equal time with religion on radio and television, and that's another one that we lost. In 1971, we challenged NASA with a suit, National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And why would we sue NASA? Well, many of you don't know this. On Apollo 7 flight, that was the first flight to go up to circle the moon, and what they were doing was taking pictures on that flight to determine the best lunar landing site for a later Apollo to actually land, uh, and they were doing reconnaissance. On that flight, written into the flight plan was what was called experiment P-1. Under that, the astronauts, who were all military personnel at that time, were given a military order in the flight plan to have a, quote, spontaneous manifestation of religious awe at exactly 7.31 p.m. plus 10 seconds as they came out from around the back of the moon on an orbit and could see the Earth out of their, the, the Earth 
earth rising up over the lunar surface. And they were given a military order to do that and to read from memory the first ten verses of the chapter of chapters of Genesis out of the Bible which were conveniently printed into the flight plan for them. Uh, to read because they were doing this on national television. They wanted essentially to prove that the good Christians with the white hats rather than the dirty, filthy, black-hatted communists would get to the moon first because we were pure of heart and all of that. In 1970, American atheists challenged President Nixon, uh, his practice of having full religious services in the White House weekly. The case was thrown out of court because, of course, this, uh, the court said that the, you can't sue a president, he has immunity. In 1987, American atheists challenged religious Christmas carol, caroling and general religious ceremonies in the rotunda of the state of Texas, and that one was dismissed. In 1987, we challenged the swearing in of jurors in the state of Texas with so help me God, and also challenged the requirement that one's religion be put up front on the juror information cards. You all know that there's a space for religion on the cards that you have to fill out in order to do jury, jury service. Um, that case uh, and a companion case in 1988 when my sister Robin Murray O'Hare was jailed in Travis County, Texas because she got a juror's oath. She came, she refused to fill out the religion blank in the card. She got into the court and she told the judge that she could not take either swearing or affirming an oath which has to end in so help me God. Uh, go and look this up. The jury oath in Texas for, for, for civil trials, both the oath that is proffered to the panel and to the final uh, jury, uh, after selection out of that panel are statutory. That is that the judge has no choice but to give them as they are exactly worded ending with so help me God. So you either have to swear or affirm so help me God if you're going to be on a jury. However, you can be a witness by taking an oath under the pains and penalties of perjury under the 